Hello, everyone. Hope you're having a great Monday night. Thank you for spending part of it with us. Welcome to the Coach McVeigh Show, presented by Microsoft Surface with our special guest, GM Les Snead. DeMarco Farr, JB Long, as we often do on these short weeks, uh, Les is kind enough to give us some of his time while the coaching staff gets to work on their game plan for the Minnesota Vikings. And Les, we were in a rut there for a little while, a few years on these short weeks on a losing streak. It's good to have you back on a winning streak now. A couple of victory Monday appearances two in for a row. you. Is it two, two in a row? Two in a row. Yeah. Yes, Let's sir. Go. I like it. <laughs> Let's keep it rolling. Uh, big picture thoughts on the win over the Raiders, the defensive driven victory for win number two. That, that's, I think that's the theme, right? The defense, which is really neat. Young, uh, not very experienced defense in terms of years in the league. That's what that's how the defense was engineered so to see them evolve each week start to play more as a collective not just as individuals and then cash in where you really really go out and make the play. probably most of our points if not all of them were off of uh turnovers caused created engineers disturbed by the defense so that's uh that's always fun to see I could care less about style points win is a win is a win this team needed a win you got it on Sunday yeah, there's the. I think I think in the moment, uh, right? We don't have a game until Thursday. Some until Sunday. You're going to talk about style, right? Aftermath, the style of the aftermath. Now again, it's a. Uh, I like to. I like to call the seasons like the Tour de France. Mm -hmm. It's 17 stages. So at the end of the day, yes, there's there's wins and losses on each stage of the way. How you won that stage or lost that stage. That's. But when we get to the final and that that final yellow jackets. Uh, awarded to mm -hmm. especially the you know, the bicyclist mm -hmm. uh, in France, you don't really talk about okay how was stage four, one. It was just you know what that counted as a win and you're wearing the yellow jersey today. Yeah, no kidding. How about what uh, Chris Shula and the defensive staff did in the lab during the bye week? There's been a lot of tweaks, especially with these last couple of games, and in the back end in particular, it seems to be coming together less. Oh, it's I it's really really neat to see Chris. Uh, let's call it put. There's you know, I would say this, the Rams, we have a, let's go, there's a DNA to how we play defense, but always encourage Chris to, okay, add your DNA, your personality, your authenticity to it. Uh, and also, right, who we have, what they do well, that's always the thing uh, all really good coaches do in the lab is, is who do we have? What are their superpowers? Let's accentuate the superpowers. And to see uh, Chris, his defensive staff come together and do that is, is always a very fulfilling thing. I'm happy when Jared Verse makes a play because it helps the Rams win, but I really enjoy watching him play. I really do. At times, you could say he might have been the best player on the field. Is that what you saw when you drafted him, that, that potential there? You know, you, what? You, here's what there's some people you watch play football, and there's an element of, hey, we can grade, evaluate, rate their skill. This is how they're, this is what they're good at. But then there's those players where even though film is 2D, 1D, I don't even know what film is, mm -hmm. you're not playing against them, but you can feel people, right, when, when they're out there. He's one of those guys that had that physics, right? Then that, that's usually some element of a combination of probably size, power, explosiveness, tenacity, urgency, just putting it all together and you're like, wow, that's a – you feel him when he goes to – uh, execute his and a serious his case of want to like he wants yeah, that, yeah, to the, be that guy that's the urgency I, I talked mm -hmm. about and and the interesting thing a, a lot of the players on our defense uh you know that's their that's their makeup we we've talked about it a lot internally is is even early in the season when we weren't quite let's call it playing totally together as a collective there are these moments where we're disruptive like we're 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 a bunch, we're like these individual tornadoes, mm. but we haven't necessarily become a collective yet, and and that's still to come too. It it's not solved yesterday. It's not engineered. It's not totally evolved. Yesterday, you will we'll see this group still go through some ups and downs, but we, you can you can feel how they're going to evolve. What they've always been able to do, like Jared Verse, is is create uh, engineer disruption. I hear you on that, and it feels like there's still um, meat left on that bone, right, in terms of opportunities that are not yet converted. I know our audience has been focused on that for much of the first month. But zooming out, like in the post-Aaron Donald universe, when you plan for scenarios, this had to be about the best-case scenario in terms of impacting an opposing passer. Like, without the greatest who's ever done it, 
the group you've assembled and what they've done through a handful of games? Yeah, that we always knew that was that was the plan, that was the vision. What's interesting is Chris, his staff, myself from 30,000 feet, but they're the ones that are in the lab this week, right, trying to figure out like how to get the other team off the field. But there is an element of, okay, we can conceptually uh, walk through, visualize what it's going to be like without Aaron Donald. And there's an element in the off season when it, you can conceptualize, wow, there's going to be a void there. The, one of the greatest ever is not going to be there. What's interesting is all of a sudden you start playing these teams and they're running plays against you that historically they haven't run mm -hmm. because Aaron changed the math. They did things differently against the Rams. Like, wait a minute, wow. Uh, all of a sudden their playbooks – opened up a little more than it used to be so we've you those guys have had to kind of live through that and mm -hmm. and understand okay this is this is different you know it, it it's almost like you're playing the offenses are like you know what Aaron Donald's not there we're really going to open up our playbook where in the past it was okay we can maybe do you know you get your coaches yeah. got their big excel spreadsheet it's like we'll just cut it down to half against Aaron Donald everything of, pulling guards are back in the <laughs> in the game plan but Kobe Turner's don't pull made a plays. guard against Aaron Fisk has made plays Michael Hoyt is a psycho out there I mean you love to see these guys grow. psycho in a good way in right? a good way in a good way he just makes plays the emotional leader uh, but when you hit don't you on, love football you can use the word psycho and it's actually it's a, a good thing. It's a compliment. Right? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's a you compliment. You can't just do that anywhere but in football. Absolutely. That's the best thing about Might football. get arrested. But, I mean, when you hit on a guy like Jared Verse or even a Braden Fisk, but what about undrafted rookie free agents? We're touching, tugging my heartstrings. Yeah. Jalen McCullough comes up <sighs> two picks. I mean, Verse is there. It's obvious. You had to find this guy. And here he is making plays. That's got to make you feel good. You know what? This is a great time to talk about you said you had to find mm -hmm. this guy. This is that's that's a that's our college scouting staff. I mean, as a GM, you're going you're especially when you have a first round pick and maybe you're going to trade up for Fisk, mm -hmm. right? You're spending a lot of energy trying to make sure of all the players who are available at those picks, right? Who do we pick? Who do we not pick? And you're not necessarily worried about who you get after the draft, but it's really neat to see. Uh, I can remember when uh, when I do know this. I, Toward the end there, you you see the favorites of, all right, this is who our college free agency kind of committees, scouts working with the, the defensive back coaches on who they want. And you can kind of see, all right, these are – and so you start game planning. Who would you draft late? Who wouldn't you? Things like that. Neat thing is on, on Mr. McCullough is just reading his profile. You didn't even have to turn on any tape at, at Tennessee. Just reading his profile, you're like, you know what? Uh, I'd bet on that guy making the team and not only making the team, contributing. You can just – maybe he wasn't the fastest in a 40, all those things, but you could just see his production, what his makeup is, especially playing the safety position. I go for that to say uh, college scouting staff, personnel staff, front office, not just myself. They come together to, you know, make things like that happen. That is a bit like college recruiting, right? That mm -hmm. after draft process, because there's a financial component to it, sure, but a lot of it is opportunity driven. Like when you're pitching yourselves, the Rams, to a McCullough, to a Josh Wallace, to an Omar Spate, you're saying, spend this off season with us and you might be a pro. Yeah, that's, I, I know there's, that's a recruiting pitch. Sometimes when you're dealing with Gen Z, a little bit chaos, hey, here's the recruiting pitch. You're gonna get to play a lot in the preseason. And historically we have, Right, so many college free agents that not only make the team but play. Right, and and Troy Reader being one of them. Right? So we, we go down. The interesting thing on the financial uh, component nowadays, right? What's what we haven't played that game is teams will guarantee a portion of their let's call it salary if they make the team. A lot of times it's up to what would be. Uh, let's call it their practice squad salary for the year, where we're just giving the player a signing bonus. There's a cap on the signing bonus for the pool of players. So usually financially, historically, I will say this, the guys recruiting for us, they're like, wow, we're, we're empty handed. Mm -hmm. Now what's you're interesting, not the, you're not the Oregon ducks of the NFL. <laughs> we're not, the, but the, here's what's interesting. A yeah. lot of times what players don't know, especially when they're getting recruited, on the other end, they haven't been in the business long enough is, okay, if I'm 
pretty solid. I'll be on the practice squad. So that guarantee they were going to make anyway, right? Mm. See what I'm saying? Teams are just guarantee that they make the practice squad. Nice little – here's the neat thing about what we found here, the way we do it is players who come here, that, you know, they're betting on themselves and they're hungry. It's not, okay, guess what? I, you know, I've got a guaranteed almost practice squad spot. I can coast. Mm-hmm. You, know, you, you can kind of feel with our guys. But I, I give our, our, our college scouts, our coaches who go through the recruiting process, they're empty-handed. Hopefully I explained it well enough for mm-hmm. the fans. That, but the neat thing is you see that group uh, come in and compete. They're almost the guys that go, you know what, I'm going to bet on myself. And uh, I'll end up with, at minimum, the practice squad salary, but maybe more. Maybe you can get one of those 53 salaries. Chuck Knox told me if I take a playoff, he's going to cut me. That's all I need to know. Yeah. <laughs> Not a lot of guarantees in no, your day. No, that's it. <laughs> so, like, Did you ever tell him I didn't take that playoff? I was just actually tired. Coach. All I said was, yes, coach. Thank you. <laughs> you know, on defense, I think we've taken a long lens on this thing, and we're starting to see it move towards fruition. On offense, maybe not so much. The plan, as I think you and Sean and others drew it up, got disrupted early, and they've not yet clicked on all cylinders. I think those days are still ahead, but where are you in terms of the lack of offensive production relative to what we thought was going to be a team that might you know, kind of lead the way with it hopefully Definitely disrupted, uh, definitely a reason. Uh, but like I said, reasons are reasons. I think what, what we have to do internally is continue doing what we have done are well aware of the disruption, but now we're evolving with the group we have. What can we do? What can we not do? And again, sometimes your opponent's going to dictate it, but oftentimes what we say in these cases, there's there's this element of an ideal, and if there is an ideal, right, there's probably an equal and opposite reaction to that, and that there's a less ideal. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, when you do, whether you're in the ideal or less ideal, there's still a game to play. Right, mm-hmm. and that game doesn't really care whether what stage of the ideal you're in, and they're still going to keep score. There's still going to be a, a win and a loss. So, again, I think what we say internally is this: when we're optimal, let's try to make the most of it, right? But oh, by the way, when we're less optimal, can we still somehow make a profit today? Again, that goes into your style points, right? Mm-hmm. We weren't. If we were optimal, maybe we have a little more style points, right? Make a little more profit. But at the end of the day, if we just make a little bit of profit, how do we make the most of these less ideal situations? And sometimes it, it's a process. Sometimes it's learning, right, what this collective is actually good at. And sometimes guess what you got to do? To to win, you got to lose first to learn some lessons on try to win. And, and again, try to win sometimes without without style. And that's that's what we're trying to do. I hear that a lot. Why can't you guys just do X, Y, and Z? Well, it's not that easy. It's You have to implement. There's a lot that goes into game planning. But over the course of your career, I mean, what haven't you gone through? I mean, you've gone through where your O-line is decimated. You're going through right now where you, you lose your top two receivers. What haven't you gone through? What haven't you been prepared for? I think, yeah. I think it, if you're in this, I mean, this is coming up on, let's call it a totality of 30 years in the NFL not quite there yet uh maybe 13 as a general manager there you you here's what i do know uh anytime you start a season now again you can start a season and not be quite ideal right but wherever you start the season you know there is going to be some version of disruption some version of chaos that's going to be not necessarily in your favor and i think that the better teams right how they deal with those when they deal with those uh, are the ones that, again, when this 17 stage, let's call it regular season race tour mm-hmm. is over, uh, they're the ones left standing to get to go on to the to the next round. So uh, that's how you got to look at it. Stay in the moment, stay in play. Uh, we could ruminate, mm-hmm. we could rewind and and talk about the good old days, but that does you no good. We could fast forward and talk about maybe when players are coming back End of the day, guess what? Where it's today, we got Minnesota Vikings on Thursday night. In this moment, stay and play. Fast forward, rewind's doing us no good. Yeah, I hope we don't have to scrub too far ahead to see Cooper Cup. It sounds like this Thursday might be the day. What's your level of anticipation for his ability to make things right, not just for the offense, but for this entire organization? You know, I think he's he's definitely going to help, right? And there's that's Cooper's Cooper. He's been Cooper. Uh, but again, there's even with that, even though he's coming back healthy, right? 
things may not be exactly like there were uh, at the end of OTAs when we when we had him and Puka, right? They might not be like they were the first half of the Detroit game when we had him and Puka and healthier people. So at the end of the day, there will still be an element of disruption when he comes back because – Right, we're still trying to figure out who we are with the collective, and and that's what that's the puzzle you pick. But at the end of the day, hmm. Cooper Cup is a net positive, and we'll uh, figure out right how many plays he plays, what type of packages he plays, and go from there. I can't wait till they all come back. Puka, Cooper, everybody comes back, and you have a full offense. Uh, you have your Kyron numbers, right? Is there ever a time where you could call him underrated, Kyron Williams? Like an underrated running back, are we not giving him enough credit for how good he really is? You know, what? I don't. Y'all tell me, I don't necessarily. Yes, yeah. call. I hate. To, don't be offended, but I don't listen to y'all every <laughs> single day. So, are y'all not giving him his due? No, we do. We do. But go ahead. Yeah, this is awesome. But I get. I can he understand and, where you're going. Yeah, yeah. He like, and Derrick Henry are on a list of two. Put it that way, for the time being. King Henry and Kyron. Yes. And and so. Uh, Come on, let's go. I, I, give me maybe some context. Not, maybe I, we're not giving him enough praise for how good he is. You know what I mean? Like the, he's definitely had a, a, a really, really – let's call it when he got back uh, last year from the uh, IR situation from there to now, he's been a big part of our offense for sure. I, I know this. I Where I watch the game, right, and there's television on, usually you're watching the game, but tape delayed, you can turn around. I did see – a graphic that came up that, I mean, he had tied some greats for most consecutive games with a TD, Mm -hmm. maybe not number one, but he seemed like he had gotten to maybe second or third place amongst a lot of really, really – now, LaDainian Tomlinson – Chase and LT is a good place to be. I was going to say, Chase and LT, (laughs) LT's got a pretty good lead in that Tour de France. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, it seems like Kyron was definitely climbing climbing the leaderboard there. That will let you know. That's the hardest thing to do in football probably is score a touchdown, right? Things mm-hmm. get really, really tight. I always say the when you get in the red zone, they have the best safety in football. That back end zone line, it's like it's like one big safety who's the width of the field. Yeah. Yes. You know what I mean? So it's like wow you so now things get whether you're running or passing, it's a little bit a little bit harder. So the, to get down there and be someone that it just seems like he consistently scores when he's down there. And that safety never busts, never no. gets flagged for a penalty either. It's, a, it's super annoying. Um, how about the guy you drafted to be his backup and Blake Corum emerging kind of at the midway portion the, of the neat year. thing about, I, I think, with Blake is is he's someone similar to uh, uh, Jared Burst you were talking about, mm-hmm. is when, when he has run the ball. Probably need to start running him a little bit more. Or, you know what I mean? Kyron may be offended, but we got to give him a break at some point, right? Mm-hmm. Can't always climb the mountain on the – Tour de France, and if we just keep, you know, running that metaphor it's into the team. ground. Yeah. But at the end of the day, yeah. the, what I'm trying to say is when he does make a cut, there's a violent cut there, right? When he does make contact with a defender to try to get more yards after cut, there's a violence there that you feel. And I do think, uh, I do think as the season evolves, uh, we'll we'll feel him, and and he'll definitely begin contributing a little more than he even is now. Yeah. You didn't give me the Kyron numbers. Thought you were going to give me something special, no? Something special. We yeah. talked about King Henry and LT. I think he's doing just fine. Always a JB yeah, but there was no numbers. There was a JB it. stat coming. You, oh, you, nine you, you said J- with a rushing touchdown. There we there go. go. Yeah. Nine That's... straight games with a rushing touchdown. Come on. That's what I, I mean. Maybe we're not giving him enough. Even though. I knew that, JB. I mean, <laughs> come on. What do you got else? You got it. I mean, sorry, JB. No, 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 it's fine. I was trying to think about the uh, yeah. the peloton that like every every cyclist oh, needs someone go. to draft off of a little bit, right? There Over you the go. course of a 17 stage season. Uh, should we talk some kicking? Like yeah. it, it seems like second and third chance kickers are kind of like some of the most consistent across the league now. I'm not saying that that Cardi needs a second or third opportunity, but where are you with uh, your rookie kicker as he kind of wobbles a little bit here in recent weeks? I think you stick with him. I think. Uh, We've we've been going through this kicking thing for the last few years. Here's what here's what's really really interesting, is if you've with rookie kickers, if you if a rookie kicker was very successful in college, there is moments during probably his rookie season, and and even uh, in Cardi's sake, it hasn't really happened yet. But he has missed his last two kicks where they may go through a slump. Hmm. Usually, kickers who were successful in college right 
after their rookie. Sometimes they'll get it back on and, and they become a little bit more consistent, right? But I forget, you may know his numbers. Is he is he 9 of 11 total? I mean, if he only ends up with two misses, whatever, that's a good year. Yeah. What I am trying to say is there is this subset of sometimes we take these kickers who – uh, probably were a little less accurate in college, but they have really strong legs, right? Mm-hmm. And if, as rookies or what have you, as young kickers, if they somewhat become a little less accurate, they sometimes never get it back because they never really were. They just, if we go to golf, they were able to really drive the ball, mm-hmm. but maybe land it in the rough instead of the fairway sometimes. So Cardi's one of those players, one of the reasons we drafted him that, right, was, was accurate, uh, from many distances for a lot of years at Stanford, and, and usually, right, the pop probability says that uh, he'll will he will basically at the end of the day that'll transcend that'll uh, right translate to our league and be very similar to how he was at Stanford. They're just like every other player. I mean, you you can pat him on the back, say you're still my guy. Go out and nail the next one, right? That's how it goes. That's how it is. Yeah. Other than probably. DeMarco, if you're a defensive lineman and you're coming. you're out of gap <laughs> and someone bails you out, no, hey, if you're out of gap and there's a 10-yard run, it's like, wow, was DeMarco trying to get an edge there and make a TFL and he left us hanging? But really, it's you, the average fan's not really like, man, I just – but when you're a kicker and it doesn't go between those yellow posts, oh, yeah. it's like, okay, it's, e- it's either a pass or fail. In your case, kind of out of gap, C plus for the day. What we say about Aaron? Production equal tolerance. Mm-hmm. See, as long as I make big plays, I can make a mistake or two, but not place kickers. That's the way yeah. that goes. Uh, we technically, did, they can't. Yeah. It's just they're just probably again in the yeah. style in the in the aftermath. It's. I was going to say his passing. game winner against San Francisco. Oh, he's he's still got some uh, runway to you burn. You got with some me. credit. That's here. a pass a day. Right, that's a pass day. So we don't well, talk about I, that. Oh. Really, in the style points, that's an A plus day, right? He grew up a San Francisco fan. Then he says, "You know what? I'm a Ram now. I'll put the dagger in the Niners." I mean, that's an A plus, right? I want to be that hero. Yes, big time. Um, we were talking about the turnaround the special teams has made on punt uh, last season. Problem this year. Wow, going down and covering. You Watch, know, it, yeah, the, I think it, you chase his staff. Uh, players everyone evolving trying to get better like you said you you're there's some lessons to learn from last year and Mm -hmm. and and they were learned but I I give everyone you know credit for doing their part as we've tried to figure out uh, a way to settle the special teams down Les what can you say about this moment in time like it's not lost on Rams fans that at two and four the division's flat they're Mm -hmm. still in the thick of it Uh, last year we saw the Rams win a couple of home games in five days at SoFi Stadium we're all hoping they can replicate that formula and then you got your first chance at Seattle on the back side of that with the trade deadline looming. What context can you give us? Uh, to context where the Rams is are? hardest thing you can do: stay and play. If we if we if we rewind, it would be like, wow, what if we'd have beaten uh, Chicago? What if we'd have come through against Green? What if we were through? Hey, then you, you fast forward. Uh, stay and play. Seventeen game stage, a little bit like last year. Uh, not saying it's going to happen, but if we can kind of stay in the moment and right try to win games, uh, play quality football first, win the games. At the end of the day, the math will usually catch up, right? The math. But if you start – if you, and I get it, it's tough, right, if you're a fan. If you start doing the math a little bit too early, mm-hmm. the hole could look a little bit deeper. But, again, whatever the hole is now is irrelevant. It's, it's what it is later. And I think, I think internally I've always thought personally – when I chat with people around the building is this, look, uh, if you start slow, uh, we will feel an element of, of fulfillment if we finish strong. And if you finish strong right at that point, that's when you can really look up at the map and you go, you know what? That's when you can start playing Oh, if We'd only won this game. We were this seed or what have you. Key is try to stay in the moment try to play quality football one game at a time and and again it could we could be fortunate and win on Thursday night but that doesn't you better stay in the moment because that win could easily be erased right if you come back and, and and don't stay in the moment 
I was never knocked out of my gap, just to correct that over there. <laughs> but I, I bet you, perfect. I bet you, he intentionally ran out of his See? gap. Here's, a, right you know, here's a cool one. <laughs> if you go do a little search on the short list of Rams yes. who have had a sack and an interception in the same game, it's probably the only conversation that you'll ever see Kobe Durant and DeMarco Farr together in. Sack and a pick. Well, I, I can tell you game. that I can remember probably I was probably a Falcon then and at one time we were in the Rams division. Yeah. Right with the, the old NFC West. Yes. I don't know why Falcons and Rams were in the West. I guess Rams were LA to There was only one team but actually he, in the West then. Yeah, <laughs> he, it was St. Louis. But there yeah. there isn't out when you played DeMar the, you knew this. They, he, they, his helmet was probably getting <laughs> into the offensive backfield before anyone else. There was you did. I bet you the OL did not want to play. That pick was Bobby Abear. Was them in Atlanta? See, there you go. Good memory. <laughs> Less one of the reasons I think we're fortunate to have this conversation with you today is it because it comes at a unique moment in Rams history mm -hmm. where Sean McVay with this week's victory uh, tied John Robinson atop the Rams all time win total list. And as one of the guys, did he? yeah, mm -hmm. wow, you one of the guys on who was like you learn things. <laughs> in the room where it happened, right? I mean, it must feel like yesterday to you. And I know we've told the story a million times, but can you reflect on this burst of, of history that the Rams have had together in your partnership? It seems so obvious in retrospect how it was destined to work out, but I'm sure on the front end, uh, that was not guaranteed. Yeah, the, on the front end, it, it's, a, it's a bet. Uh, but you know what, when you do the vetting, you do the research, uh, you feel like that the bet's gonna, going to work out. Uh, it's, it, it's interesting though, as we're in this moment, it, sometimes it's hard to to enjoy these moments when you're. I call it. We're, we're still on active duty. Mm -hmm. We're still in the season, and, and it's like okay, reflect. The, the, but that is. It, it's interesting if you were to say, okay, you think uh, we're making a quality hire in uh, in Sean. Even if we would have said, you know what, and obviously we did. We all mm -hmm. said it, and especially. Stan, he was the one that right made the final call and said, "Okay, I want to hand the keys of the franchise to Sean in terms of the head coaching job." And then the even if you thought, "Okay, we're going to get an A," does that A mean you're the you know you tie the franchise record wins? That's it. So I didn't know that. Uh, not surprising uh, based on the. It's sometimes it's surprising that. Sean and I talking, what was it? How many years have we been together? I mean, when we say the number eight, is yeah, it eight? Eight. Like, wow, we've been together eight years. So it's not surprising when you say, okay, eight, we've had some success. I bet she's getting close to the top of that's pretty. I mean, that point's cool. well taken that you all are optimistic about that decision. Otherwise, you wouldn't have selected it. But if mm -hmm. we had told anyone from ownership on down at that moment that you're about to hire the winningest coach <laughs> in franchise history, that would have made an impression. Because I, you, you think about it here. I mean, there's this is, I mean, there's been some, I mean, yeah, Chuck Knox, mm -hmm. Dick Vermeil. So I don't know who's two, three, four, five, but there has been, I mean, Allen. I mean, there's been a lot of names here. How long they coach, I'm not as uh, let's call it nuanced in the yeah. exact history, but. Consistency, the truest measure of performance, right? Isn't that one of Sean's favorite wow. sayings? And, yes. And what's cool is that it applies to him equally. I wonder what your record is as a GM. We need to you know, look that up. That's yeah, got to be at the top of the list. See, I need to know this stuff. Yeah, I hadn't. Again, when you're on active duty, I don't think you ever <laughs> figure out, okay, what's your, your record? I forgot. I, the, the interesting thing yeah. is I would probably, if I went to look at my record, I would probably look at the first thing my eyes would go to were the losses, and I'd go, man, I felt those. I'm, that's why I got gray hair. Right? Yeah. I'd right point here. to some of the wins, like that I, Aaron Donald guy, and more recently, yes. these uh, <laughs> college free agents. And how about Jordan Whittington? Yes. Day wow. three continues to be uh, fertile soil for Les Snead and you his staff. You can pan so. some gold, your whole scouting department, some good players, and you got guys to coach him up. So, yes, this you is You had a good the spot. inside scoop, though, from Austin, though. That had to be one of your easier ones, right? You know what? That, I, I, we joke a lot of time if I'm, I'm an area scout for one school, and that's Texas right now. So, uh, <laughs> uh, we, should, you know, we, should, I, we should be able to get those somewhat right. Keep dipping into Tennessee, too. Whether it's Agent Zero, B Y, that's when you got to. That's when you got to listen. Right? Yeah, you can't. You know, I'm, I'm the area scout for Texas, and uh, and then 
let everybody else dominate their role in the other schools. Good job calling dibs on that one. It's a pretty good program to be oh, yeah, that drawn from right now. All of a sudden they're, you know, they're Final a, thought on uh, Thursday. You want to preview the Vikings for us before we wrap this up? They're a quality team uh, offensively and defensively. Maybe they're so good on – they're playing so well on both sides of the ball that I'm not even sure – how their special teams are doing. But, uh, <laughs> I, I think you, you think of the Vikings, you think uh, what uh, Coach Flores is doing with their defense. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely uh, fun to watch, probably not fun to play him. And really cool to see an alumni in Coach O'Connell work with the entire team and, and the offensive side of the ball and what they've been able to do, right? Especially at, at, at QB as they've made a transition and, and even had injuries uh, at times would, would Kirk and, and have the success they've had. So uh, they're going to be definitely, definitely. I know this. They're going to play quality football. No doubt. We're on to Minnesota. <laughs> Long live Les and Sean. Here's Let's to go. your next uh, 79 and 80 wins in eight years of partnership. See, there you go. I like it. <laughs> and to the Coach McVay show, Les need winning streak continuing. Let's, go th let's get to three, baby. Microsoft Surface. <laughs> have a great week, everyone. Hope we can see you uh, Thursday at SoFi. Mm -hmm.